Welcome to this week's edition of Blueprint CFO Presents, our every other Friday podcast where we feature future focused entrepreneurs. Today's guest is Eric Fenmore, the president of Garden Design Studio in Costa Mesa, Corona Del Mar, California. Garden Studio Design is a full service landscape design and also they can actually build out the project for um, the the uh, residents or your commercial buildings if you want to make it really look special uh, eric's company is the one that you want to call and he has been a client of blueprint cfo for a couple of years now and um, so i know a little bit about the company just from working with him over the, over that time if you want to contact eric to find out more about garden studio design go to their website garden studio design garden studio Garden Design Studio. Garden, Garden Studio Design. Oh, okay. okay. Garden Studio Design. Okay. Sorry about that. No uh, so, um, the sponsor of our program is Blueprint CFO, and uh, we are a fractional CFO and outsource accounting services firm. We work with our clients to help reduce the cost of chaos that may be going on in their business by helping them create a plan for the future that we call the profitability roadmap and then providing them with timely weekly and monthly scorecards that show them how they're doing at, at uh, achieving the plan. So let's kick it off with our first question to Eric. Eric, uh, how did how did the business get started in the first place? Uh, the business started sort of out of desperation. Um, my wife and I um, both started the business. So uh, in a quick nutshell, um, she and I met at UCLA as kids, and um, she went on to study landscape architecture after graduation and started her career in that industry. I started in a family finance business and uh, spent 10 years doing that. She spent about four or five years working in the landscape architecture field. We got married. We had kids. She stopped working, and the business uh, I was in was doing well. It was a family business. I was with my dad um, in uh 2000, there was a, a major event that happened to the business. We'd invested in the company and the company uh, went out of business, uh, taking large loss, uh, get, car, uh, uh, causing a large loss in our finance business. My dad at that point was 65 years old and he said, I'm going to retire. So here I was, uh, 32 years old with two young kids, a big mortgage and a nice paycheck that all of a sudden went away. Um, so I continued in the finance world, but at that point, uh, Chris, my wife decided she'd go back into doing kind of side work, um, in the landscape architecture field and literally working out of our bedroom. Um, we lived in a little house in Corona Del Mar and it was, you know, 1800 square feet with two young kids and she worked in the bedroom when she could. And very quickly I realized, you know, she was making a little bit of money doing landscape design, but the opportunity was in the construction side. So very quickly, we you know, we had our design business slowly getting established, and I set up a construction business to do the installations of the design she was doing. And that was really the genesis of the business. And um, for the first four or five years of the business, I stayed in banking and finance, and we grew our, our small little business along. And um, by 2004, um, the company had started to get some good traction, so I resigned from banking. We rode that that pre-2008 real estate crash or recession crash uh, pretty well. And then all of a sudden in, in 2008, the wheels came off the bus. Um, I, I was just doing the landscape. I quickly went back into the finance world and we continued to struggle along me in finance and landscape and her running the doing the landscape architecture work. And um, yeah, that was the beginning of the business. So really, like I said, kind of out of desperation is why it started. Well, wow. it's that you know that's a good twist and turn story there. Yeah, yeah. So I, I know the answer to this question. When you were going to when you're growing up and or going to college, you weren't thinking I'm going to end up in the uh, landscape design business, right? Not at all. No, I never thought about. Uh, gosh, never thought about being an entrepreneur per se, and certainly nothing. I knew nothing about landscape. That was not my background. Um, I think that, uh, I think when you, when, when you start a business, um, typically I think the, the founder is going to be either passionate about something or passionate about business. So I, I love using examples and you hear that a lot as I go through uh, 
uh, this talk today, but I love restaurants as an example. So let's assume you, you know, you're a great chef and you want to start a restaurant. Um, uh, your passion is cooking. Your passion is running that restaurant as a, you know, putting the best food on the table. That's very different than someone that says, gosh, I love the idea of, of having a chain of hamburger restaurants, you know, not necessarily the best, but it's a business rather than a passion. So the passion is either for the product, you know, landscape, I don't care if it's that, if it's restaurants, if it's fitness, whatever it's going to be, or the passion is business. Um, and I think what's been great about uh, the partnership of my wife and me is she's very passionate about landscape architecture and creating those spaces. I'm very passionate about growing the business and it, 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 it creates a nice um, duality because um, many entrepreneurs only have one of those things, but to bring them both together, I think is very, is very beneficial. Yes. So, I mean, when I first started working with Eric, I thought landscape design, I didn't really understand the, the scope of the kinds of projects that garden design does. They, they're, they're amazing. Um, and uh, the, you've done work all around the country. It's not just Southern California. So mm -hmm. the, you've built a brand that is recognized as, as excellent in the, um, in creating uh, wonderful, exciting back, backyards or front yards, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, you alluded to, um, you know, going down the road, there was the recession and people didn't have any money to spend on mm -hmm. landscape design probably. But what other, what other kinds of uh, twists and turns did you have? How many years has it been now? It's, so it's, it's been, been uh, 22 years. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, 22 years. So, look, I think that um, adaptability is extremely important. So if you look, you know, when we started the business, it was that housing boom from, you know, 2001, 2002, all the way to late 2007. Then the, the crash came and, and the ability to adapt is so important because there was there was nothing we could do in that environment. There was, you know, literally housing came to a stop. Right. So there was nothing we can do there we could do there so adaptability for us we cut overhead we were very we 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 had a fair amount of fixed expenses we cut those you know we had a nice office and all that uh but we were very lean employee wise um we had some debt which i really recommend you know as best you can as a small entrepreneur to avoid debt um because that that's there no matter what happens good times or bad but adaptability is important i i um always kept my banking relationships open and I was able to pivot away from full-time landscape back into that. Um, and then, uh, you know, from there, um, I think adaptability, there are twists and turns. Um, COVID was a very interesting twist, you know, so uh, the, the business, you know, after the, the valley of 2008 through 2010 or 11, the business kind of grew on a consistent basis. Um, and then COVID hit and it was a really interesting time. Um, and, um, for us, it turned out to be after the first, you know, there was that kind of two month shock when we all shut down. I don't care what business you were in. We all shut down and, you know, we didn't move. We didn't even have meetings, even though they're outside because you didn't know if you, you know, how we'd spread germs, you know, we just didn't know. Yeah. Um, but after that people, what happened was, you know, people realized they were home and, the home remodeling boom really took off because you're sitting there at home and maybe you're going to start working at home because that home office is more important. So you want to fix up your room. You want to get your Wi-Fi strong. You want to have people over in the backyard because restaurants are closed. So you want to have a nice backyard. You want to have a nice kitchen. And that really, that really hit us very strongly in a positive way. So um, we've tripled in size um, from pre COVID to today. Um, and, um, you know, again, adaptability. We um, we very quickly went on, a, on an employee basis to Zoom. Uh, we had, if you remember, the six fit spacing. So we had our office. We grew our office space to allow our employees to be in, but spaced properly, wearing masks and doing the testing and all those things we had to do. But we adapted, and um, you know, we we were able to really prosper and grow during that time um, because we did adapt quickly. We saw the opportunity and we seized on it. And um, I do think that uh, opportunistic um, passion, I'm not sure the proper term for, but being opportunistic is really important as an entrepreneur. You know, if you're, again, if you're a restaurant and everybody loves that, you know, that 
chicken dish you make and no one's liking the steak dish you make, then sell more chicken dishes and talk about the chicken <laughs> yeah, dishes, right? Yeah. Go with the Do you think the steak is better? Listen to the market, you know, and be opportunistic. Um, yeah. I think, uh, you know, I, I, something I'd like to talk about, you know, I, I mentioned, um, you know, you start a business, I think, for passion, either for a product or for the idea of, of running a business. I think something that's uh, I've found is very successful um, uh, part of our business is we have found a niche that's not um, extremely appealing. Um, so, for example, if you want to open a restaurant, there is in every single town, on every single street, there's restaurants. It's very competitive, right? And if you want to open an Italian restaurant because your grandma's recipes were awesome and she made them, you better be really friggin' good um, because you've got competition right around the corner. Um, and if you can be really good in a competitive market, you can do phenomenally well. But you, but you better be very, very good. I've chosen to go into, or I guess fortuitously, I found uh, an industry that is not competitive. Um, there are not a lot of quality, there are very good quality landscape architects and landscape construction firms out there. Uh, however, they tend to be very small, very fractured, um, and there's very little name brand recognition out there. Um, and to me, what we've been able to do is establish our brand um, in, a, in a market where, again, there's not a lot of competition that's of any size. Again, there are every, every town has a little landscape architecture firm and landscape contractors, but there's really no name brand out there that's recognizable. You know, if I asked anyone listening to this podcast, um, name me three landscape architects and three landscape contractors, they probably couldn't name one. Um, if I said, name me three restaurants, they could name 10. If I said, name me three Italian restaurants, they could name 10. If I, you know, uh, so I think finding a good niche to me is really good. And if you're opportunistic within that niche, um, you can really grow it. So again, using the analogy of a restaurant, if I was a restaurant owner and everybody loved the chicken we made, I would figure out a way to make a frozen chicken I could sell at the supermarket. I would figure out a way to bottle the sauce or whatever it is to grow and, and multiply the opportunity of what you have that's great. And if you get in an industry that's less competitive, you have a better opportunity to do that. You know, if you're in the, uh, you know, you go to the supermarket and there's a hundred salsas out there, you know, how if I make the best salsa, it's really hard to stand out next to the other salsas out there. Um, yeah. So I, I love the idea of having, niche opportunities that you can really grow. So I would, for me, having that niche industry has been a great asset for our growth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing I would observe is, you know, a lot of our clients are, are like your wife, Chris, they're cr the creative people mm -hmm. and they've created some cool thing, um, whether it be a service or a technology or, or even a product. And, um, but they don't have the luxury of having somebody you next to them, uh, that has a finance background, you know? So that's, yeah. that's, that's kind of how we play with our clients. Um, Absolutely. But, you know, just listening to what you just said there, it's about, you know, Chris, Chris is kind of leading the way from the, the ex expertise of the mm -hmm. design and making sure it's world class. And then you're the business person saying, how can we monetize this? Yeah. And take advantage of the, yeah. you know, the lack of competition in, in this niche. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, talking about, um, blueprint as just an example what, one of the things i've really learned early on um in, in business or maybe not early on but as we grew um and that is this uh when you start a business you do everything yourself going back to the restaurant if you've got a small restaurant you know if it's chris and me i'm the chef i would say she's the chef i'm the i'm the maitre d right so she's cooking every single meal i'm introducing myself to every client sitting them down bringing them their food you know, paying the bills, ordering the food, we're doing everything ourselves, you know, and um, if you are successful and you start to grow, you know, if, if Chris can make 100 meals in a day, she can't make 200 meals in a day. So if we have the demand for 200 meals in a day, how do you, what do you do? How do you, how do you grow that? Because she is, she is best at making that meal, right? Well, if you break down the parts of that meal, 
uh, let's say she's making a chicken dish with onions, mushrooms, and a cream sauce. Well, she's got to chop those onions. She's got to chop those mushrooms. And that's not, that's not magic. The magic is putting it together, right? And so I think it's really important as you grow to start to value your time and value what you're best at and what you enjoy doing. And those are the things you've got to focus on. So for example, if you're making $100,000 a year as a business owner, there's 2,000 work hours in a year. That means you're making $50 an hour. If you want to make $200,000, that means you've got to make $100 an hour. So what you've got to do is analyze what you are doing that is you're being paid above $50 an hour for and below $50 an hour for. And the only way to make more money is to start to pay people less than $50 an hour are those things that you're doing that you can pay someone else to do for less than $50 an hour. So you're yeah. specializing. So, you know, at this point, Chris charges X dollars for her design work. Um, it takes her, let's say 10 hours to do a design, but it takes the whole package, let's say 500 hours to get the whole project done or whatever the number is. She needs to spend her time in those 10 creative hours and pay people to do everything else. And, that's extremely important. So I'm going to just make it simple. You know, in our lives, somebody picks up my dry cleaning every day. You know, my, somebody is in our house, cleaning our house every single day of the week. Um, you know, we pay people to do things so that we can have the freedom to do the things that make us money, right? The higher, the higher and, level. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, yeah. I, I, I also want to emphasize, you know, look, there's passion, right? So if you love to cook, I'm not suggesting you bring a chef in to cook for you, even though you could make more money, you know, uh, having a meal delivered and be working more. I'm not suggesting you don't do what you love doing, but if there's things you're doing in your life that you don't enjoy doing, if you don't enjoy doing laundry, what the heck are you doing spending three hours a week doing laundry for, right? You yeah. can take that, you can have somebody pick it up and for 20 bucks or 30 bucks or 50 bucks, they're going to deliver you folded laundry. That's probably better than you can do. And you don't have to waste your three hours. You can go work. You can go to the gym. You can meditate. You can spend time with your loved ones. You can travel. You can sleep. Whatever it is that's important, um, you can spend the time doing those things. So it's really important to get, uh, in my opinion, to get things off your plate that are not producing revenue for you. Yeah. Um, so, well, you know, so we have, you know, many of our clients, we see where they're trying to do everything. Right. And I think that's what you're alluding to. They, right. They're doing yeah. the sales. They're doing the operations. They're doing the yeah. finance of the county. Well, yeah, I know that. So that was I'm sorry, I kind of di diverged there. But that was my point on on, on Blueprint is I, I was doing the finance. Right. And now I have Blueprint doing my finance for me. I like finance. I like to look at the big stuff. I don't want to do the day to day entries that, you know, that takes yeah. a lot of time and I can pay you guys a fraction of what I make and, and let me be freed up to do what I want to do. And additionally, you know, if you just do that, you're probably much better at it than I am. And the same analogy, if Chris, my wife is cutting onions all day, you get, you know, or, or making a whole, a whole fa her famous chicken and you just get one person to just cut onions. They're going to get really good at cutting onions, probably better than she ever was, yeah. you know? Right. And I think that's special. Maybe, maybe they like cutting onions. That's all they want to do, you know? So yeah, put, put them in a role where they get to be themselves and do the things they like to yeah. do. That's so I, I would I would say you know a huge thing I, I probably the one of the top lessons I've learned in business is to value your time. If you want to make more money, and that's why most of us work is to make more money. Make sure you value your time and pay people to do those things that you either don't want to do, or can pay someone less than what you uh, what you make to do for you. Yeah. That, that's a really good way of, of stating it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to ask two questions. One is, um, the, and they're, they're related. One is, uh, sometimes things like COVID happen, which you're not expecting, and you have to make, you have to <laughs> pivot quickly, right? So this year, I know you're, you're, a, you're a, a construction firm. A lot of your mm -hmm. revenue comes from construction, and yes. construction is done outside for landscape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm looking out my window right now. It's raining and it's yep. been raining yep. in California for months. Yep. Couple, it seems like a couple of months. And so what what happened there? Were you able yeah. to continue production or did you no. have to pivot? Or? Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, so uh, as we've grown, 
Um, one of the things I've really started to focus on is transparency with my employees. It's very typical when you're a small business, you know, you keep everything in your head. You don't communicate well about the big picture. And, um, you know, maybe as you're successful, uh, you're, you don't want to tell your employees that you're making this much money, they're making this much money. Um, but I've started to realize that transparency is really important um, to get the buy-ins and, you know, um, I happen to love uh, I happen to love watching certain TV shows and they teach me lessons. Um, and I, for some reason, restaurants really appeal to me as uh, a, a metaphor for our business. It's a lot of chaos, a lot of different departments, you know, and uh, if you look at going to a very fine restaurant, you know, there's so many things that can go wrong that can ruin your experience. Right. Um, so I. I, we were watching I, Chris and I were watching a show recently called The Bear, and it's a it's a it's a great show about um, it's a struggling restaurant in Chicago. And I, no need to go into the details, but I highly recommend that show, by the way, if you want to watch a good one. Um, and so uh, they've got money troubles, they've got health violations, all this stuff. And so when the rain hit uh, for us and 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 uh, two thirds of our revenue is from construction. So it's our it's our big it's our kind of our our muscle that drives the car. Um, you know, design is why we're in business, but it's a construction that um, is the biggest muscle. Um, and, uh, you know, the way the holidays fell, we lost about two weeks of the end of December. And then we got hit with three solid weeks of rain in January. And another, you know, we, we've lost, uh, we're now probably in, it's March 15th-ish. We've lost, it has been nine or 10 weeks of the quarter. We've probably lost five weeks. So, that's half of our revenue we can't generate. We can't work overtime because the days are short. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's very challenging. So I brought the team together and um, I said, you know, here we are. You know, so imagine we're a restaurant and we can't get steak. You know, what are we going to do? And then stay, we're a steakhouse. We can't get steak. What are we going to do? Um, and that's kind of what the, the boat we are in. Um, and uh, again, nothing we can do, um, you know we we can't work yeah um, you just gotta come up you gotta come up with a short-term plan then right yeah so the short-term plan was you know we we um we have five different divisions we have design we have construction we have procurement uh we have referrals and um we have well stone procurement and furniture procurement so i said team we've got to look towards our non-construction revenue and figure out how we boost those sales. So everybody's got to work together to support the procurement divisions. Construction team, if the procurement team needs you to go pick something up and deliver it somewhere, get on it. And when we just pulled the team together and said, there ain't no steak coming into our steakhouse for the next period of time. What are we going to do? We talked about it. We tightened our belts a little bit and got through it. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, we focused on getting um designs done that could go into construction as soon as possible so as soon as we got a break in rain we could get started we use a lot of subcontractors we got out there found new subcontractors and said hey we got to pick up our second quarter has got to kick ass we have all this backlog we got to get done you know jim wants to be swimming in this pool by june he doesn't care that it's been raining and we can't work for six weeks we got to right. swim in june you know he's got to be swimming in june so let's make sure we get the resources set up for that next as soon as the rain breaks, we can get out there and work twice as hard as the days get longer. Let's plan to work overtime. Let's really, you know, if you need to take a break right now and, and rest up, you know, to get ready for that stretch run that's going to happen. So we, we I think the key thing there is was transparency and communication and not, you know, my my initial my initial thought was, you know, tighten up and not not communicate about it. And then I realized, you know, it was important for the team to understand what we, what we were going through, get their ideas, get their feedback, you know, um, get the get the steak, the steak chefs off the steak and teach them how to make salmon, you know, that kind right. of thing. Find exactly. a new salmon recipe. And that that's what we did. And we we pulled through. It's not been a great start to the year. I mean, there's no, no nobody no, sure of that. Can't but we're ready. That, but... We're ready as soon as the rains break. And, you know, this last storm is a little bit of a surprise, but it is what it is. And um yeah, yeah, we're ready for it. Hopefully this is it. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, you know, this the podcast series is one thing is about tips for entrepreneurs. So if if uh, there's anybody out there listening that's thinking about starting a business and having yeah. their own business where they're currently an employee, what 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 would you say is the best part of owning your own business? Um, I would say I, I really um, I take a lot of pride in giving opportunities to my employees um, and supporting their growth. Um, I really, really take a lot of pride in that. And I take a lot of pride in the fact that, you know, we've got 27 employees in the office and we probably have another hundred subcontractors out there working. So I look at it, you know, I'm, I'm supporting 120, 150 people, you know, their families. And, um, you, you know, I, I, another, you know, I talked about restaurants, but I love sports teams, you know, and, and, um, you know, we want to be a winning team on the field. And if we're a winning team on the field, not only is the team on the field winning and getting paid well and wearing rings and getting all the accolades, it's also the usher in there that's selling the hot dogs and, and, you know, that's making more money because more people are coming in and they're excited and they're, you know, buy more hot dogs and buy more beer and, Cracker Jacks, all those things happen. You're supporting this this um, this this group. I I take a lot of pride in that. And um, you know, we were talking before the podcast started about you know uh, the future. I don't. I'm not a big guy about transitional wealth. I'm. I, I want to transition this to the team. I want to have them. You know, we have a lot of younger people at our company, and I want them to walk away with a skill, walk away with a future. Um, and I take a lot of pride in that. I, I really do. And that's probably the, the, the best thing about running a small business for that, me. I mean, that, that was a surprising answer, but I think it's a great answer. So, you know, thanks for sharing that. What about, um, you know, the worst part of owning your own business that entrepreneurs? Yeah, just um, look, the stress of the stress of uh, of it all, just the same way. It's a stress of, um, of you know, when we have a, a period like this, you know, my my team is paid and they get profit sharing and those kind of things well it's really hard to announce the team that there ain't no profit sharing this quarter because we haven't worked and maybe next quarter is not going to be either because we've had to put money into the business to support this deficit you know yeah um that's hard so disappointment but i think transparency gets you there um you know th this is an external thing we can't control the rain it's not a mismanagement thing it's a, you know, it's an external threat that we can't control. You know, again, if I was a restaurant and I can't get beef because there's mad cow disease and literally there's no beef or the supply chain shortages that happened during COVID. If you make mattresses and there's no springs, you can't sell a mattress without a spring. There's nothing you can do, you know? Yeah. So I think, um, I think that's the hardest part is just the, um, when, you know, when the team isn't winning for any number of reasons, external, internal, when the team isn't winning, it's hard. And it's hard because, you know, uh, everybody, again, I, I, while I believe we all hope to work for passion, we do work to make money. That's the end. Of, that's that's the reason we work. If we didn't have to make money, we might just go lay on the beach all day long or go surf or go ski or whatever it is you love to do. Um, yeah. We work for money. And so it's, you know, I, 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 that's the hardest part is when we can't reward those that have worked really hard um, because of a failure. Um, yeah. And it it, 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 it it pains me deep in my heart, you know? Um, but again, I think transparency gets you there. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that it's interesting when the company was younger and we had fewer employees, um, we've had very, very little turnover over the years, but it's happened. And it used to really, really eat me up to have to let somebody go. Um, and as we've grown, um, going back to the, you know, the team analogy, the sports team analogy, um, if, if I'm the owner of the team or the manager of the team and the goal is to win the Super Bowl, and that's how, that's our goal. You know, um, if I've got a player at any position that isn't doing their job, you know, let's just say it's someone on the offensive line, you've got the star quarterback, you know, you've got, you've got Tom Brady back there in the backfield and your right tackle isn't that good. And Tom Brady gets sacked and gets injured. Team loses. We're not going to win the Super Bowl without Tom Brady in the backfield, right? And so to me, <coughs> you find you have someone that's struggling. It is hard to say to them, hey, 
get your stuff together, you got to go. But the team's being let down if you don't do that. And it's about the team winning. It's about the team succeeding. If I'm extra nice and supportive of one person who doesn't deserve it, then the team suffers. And that's not fair to the other 27 people in the room or the 120 other subcontractors that work for us indirectly. So having the best team on the field um, is vitally important and, and promoting those that are ready to be starters and demoting those that aren't and getting rid of those that really aren't. And that's, it, it's, it, it used to be much more difficult. Now I find it's, um, it's the right thing to do Yeah, for the team. So one issue that a lot of entrepreneurs have, including me, is work-life balance. Yep. Um, I tend to work a lot of hours because mm -hmm. I love what I'm doing. And, you know, like you said, I'm also, you know, all about my people. I'm trying to build a career yep. path for everybody. How, how do you feel like you're doing there in terms of, you know, having time, free time outside of the business? Yeah, the yeah. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to elaborate on this one a little bit. Um, hope I don't go too much off onto a tangent, but um so we talked about Blueprint CFO. Um, I've got three other resources in my business arsenal that have really helped me. Um, so the first um, is my Vistage group, and that's actually where you and I met. So Vistage is a small business um, mentorship group, I guess you'd call it, led by a leader. And you'll have you know eight to 10 to 15 people in this group, typically business owners uh, similar in size to you. Um, and uh, that's been a great resource for me um, as, you know, where I'm not just alone, if you will, uh, in my own head. Second is productive learning. So productive learning is a group that um, similar to Vistage for business, productive learning is about personal growth. Um, and the third thing, I've got a group I'm working with uh, right now called Lead with Purpose, and it's a management uh, consulting company that's helping us in our growth and helping us in our systems. So getting as you grow getting external input in to help in your growth because what happens when you're a small business owner it's all in your head and you may have family or friends that give you input but you know they're not necessarily professionals and what they're you know they're going to give you the best advice they can if they care about you but that's not their job and so to as you grow to pay professionals to give you advice and 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 listen to them i think that's extremely important um and I, I, I've gone on a tangent, but I'll, I'll be coming back to your question in a second. Um, I think the the thing I've learned uh, as we've grown the business is that my uh, my strengths and my weaknesses in my personal life tend to carry over into my business life. So, for example, um, uh, if someone's a narcissist always thinking about themselves, thinking they're always right. And you're, that's happening at home. You might have strife in your family relationships with your, with your wife, spouse, wife, husband, partner, whatever, with your kids, because you're always right. You know, you're that narcissistic type. And your wife might say to you, you know, you're always thinking about yourself. And um, I have found, and I think it's probably true for most entrepreneurs, that same personality is going to exist in your business. So working on your personal growth, I think, you know, my business life is no different than my, my home life as far as the way I act and how I feel and how I treat people. So working on yourself um, and understanding who you are makes you better at the home and in, in, in business. And um, so to that end, um, to answer your question, uh, I think that um, working on yourself, taking time to work on yourself uh, physically, you know, making sure you're staying in shape, making sure you're eating well, um, making sure you're uh, mentally healthy, all of those things are personal, right? I go to the gym five days a week. You know, I, in the middle of the day, I leave it usually at three o'clock from work and I go to the gym workout. And, um, you know, that's selfish, right? That's if you look at it truly, why am I why am I doing that? How can I justify what if my employees did that? Right. Uh, I, I'd really be, you know, I, I, I might be concerned about that as a boss, but that's about the balance about about uh, being healthy. So 
Um, and that makes me, in my opinion, makes me better. I think when I, I find my, my best times of, of growth and creative thought and the way the business is going to grow come when I go on vacation, when I unplug, when I get away from that run, 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 stress, stress, stress all day long that we all feel as, as small business owners and just, you know, let it wash away, get a massage, go skiing, whatever it is I'm doing. Um, that's when my thoughts come to me that are actually productive because all day long, you're just putting fires out. You know, we all, we're all doing that. Right. Yeah. And stepping away does it. So it is valuing, uh, it is, it is getting that, that value of, uh, knowing, um, that, um, that stepping away and being healthy, it actually helps the business. Right. And that gets into, you know, going back to employees, um, paying them to do the job that you don't want to do or not as good at the, as them at, or it's below your pay grade that empowers them, trust them, trust them to chop those onions correctly. Don't go in there and bust their chops every time the onions too big or too small, let them figure it out, you know, let them make a mistake. Let them, you know, you let them dent the car, not wreck the car, right? Um, let them do that. Um, I, I think that's so important. And by doing that, you empower them and you get to pull away more and more. It, it's it's very interesting. Something we, I, I mentioned, I'm working with this group, Lee with Purpose. And part of the process was to look at our strengths and weaknesses, uh, the SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And um one of the things that I put as a, a threat to our business was Chris and me being less involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. So we, we put together this SWOT analysis and there was, you know, a hundred different words up on the board or ideas up on the board. And, and the 11 of us on our leadership team voted on these things and we ident identified our top SWOT. And um, it was very interesting. That was my one of my number one things was Eric and Chris no longer involved day to day on a full time basis. That's a threat to the business. The only person out of 11 that voted on that and like out of like, you know, 20 votes with me, nobody else. <laughs> yeah, nobody else. Thought that was going to be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's that was really insightful to me. They 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 believe in themselves. They trust in themselves. They believe yeah. the future is in their hands, and that's that's awesome. That's and they care more. about you too. That they they want you to have a good life, you know, not just be tied up in the business all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, that you know, um, good people want to do it themselves. They don't want to be told what to do all the time. They want to say, you know, just just like a kid, you know. There's a yeah. what, what's the uh, you know you. I think uh, what do they? I do, we do, you do, right? So that's the way you talk about kids. If you want your kid to, you know, make their first pancake. I'm going to do it first. I'm going to show you how to make a pancake. Here's where I mix it, put it in the pan. Here's where we flip it. Here's the syrup, the butter, blah, blah, blah. Second time we do it. We do it together. You're going to mix it and I'm going to help you flip it. And then they do it. And, you know, that's a really great way to, I think, to, to manage people as well. Let them show them what to do. You know, watch me. Let's do it together. And then you go. Will it be as good as me the first time? No, it won't be. But by the 10th time, it probably will be. And if it's not, then they probably have to go. You know? Yeah. yeah. That's okay. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up here with one last question. And mm -hmm. Eric has shared so much uh, good information and good thoughts about running your business and, and doing the right thing. Um, Eric, is there any last minute tips that you want to share about to budding entrepreneurs that are out there yeah. thinking about? Yeah, um, I think that um, something that Chris uh, has really emphasized um, in our business is she calls it CNB scene. And, um, you know, what that means uh, to me is a, a couple of things is, um, number one, you're always a representative for your company, right? So Chris is one of those ones, you know, she does her exercise. She is never going to be walking around in her yoga pants all day long. She is never going to walk out of the house without her makeup on, looking good, looking professional with a clean car and not bald tires and, you know, present because any moment you can walk into a client, into a referral source, whatever. So make sure that you are representative of who you are at all times. Um, and it's something we've taught our kids, you know, if, if you're at the bar drunk as a skunk and your boss walks in, do you want him to see you that way? You know, um, if it's your 21st birthday and you're going crazy, Hey, you know what? That's great. But if it's a Thursday night and you got to work the next day, 
No, you know, be respectful, have self-respect. So see and be seen. The second one, you know, the second part of that is support your support your clients. You know, um, if they have an event, show up for it. Go see their in our work. Go see their project. Go go. You know, when they're done with the job, go over there and yeah. bring a bottle of wine and say, "Can't wait to sit in the backyard and barbecue together in this beautiful space you've created." Honor them. Honor their project all the way through. So it's it's so impa- it's so powerful and and um, you know as we've built our brand, there's, there are so many, uh, indirect tendrils. And again, Jim, if you look at your business, you know, um, you know, you, you go into a restaurant and, and you, and you, you're respectable and you tip well, and you listen and you appreciate the food and you say, by the way, I'm, you know, this is what I do. And, and maybe the, this, maybe the restaurant owner says, gosh, we're struggling with our finances. I'd, I'd love to talk to you, you know? Um, and so you're representing yourself, even on a Friday night at your favorite restaurant, you're representing your business. And, um, uh, you know, Chris and I, we uh, we were down in um, in Mexico on vacation with our kids, and we ran into um, a, these, this couple, and they were from Texas, and they had a lot of money, and they were building a house. And next thing you know, you know, we were there. They saw our kids. Our kids showed up well. They, you know, and next thing you know, we had a client in Texas. You know, um, again, if we're showing up and we're sloppy and we're you know, drunk and, and treating our kids like crap and whatever, um, we're jerks, you know, so you show up, represent yourself consistently. So I think that is so important for us small business owners is realize that, you know, look, if you're a skater and that's your, if you're you're selling skateboard apparel, you should be looking that way. You should have a skateboard under your, and there's nothing wrong with that in the slightest, but represent who you are as a business owner every day. And that's who you are. And you never know who you're going to meet, when you're going to meet them. Uh, it, it's vitally important, I think. That, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I I like that too. I, I feel like being, um, I mean, I'd say dressing. Dressing professionally is important yeah. because, yeah. you know, it, it just happened to me just what you just said. I went in to get a service at a, at a retail store and I, I they happened to see what I did because I was having a picture that I had an article about be framed and mm-hmm. uh, they said well hey what do you do and how could yeah. you get help yeah. Our business? yeah it's crazy you know and if i, I if i would have went in there and been a like you said a jerk I, yeah they would have just said okay well we don't want to work yeah. with this guy absolutely absolutely yeah, yeah. okay well that's going to wrap it up for this uh week's episode uh our next episode will be on march 24th at 12 15 p.m where our guest is going to be jeff clark of J Squared General Contractors, and uh, we'll hear more probably hear more about the weather and how that's affecting his business. But uh, look forward to that. Jeff Clark has been one, I think, one of our longest uh, clients at Blueprint. So I'm really excited to have him on the show. And thank you very much for per, per, per participating on this show, Eric. Um, I, I'm all the things that you shared were so so powerful. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity, Jim, and thanks for uh, Blueprint for all your help. All right. And see you, see you everybody uh, two weeks from now. Great. Thanks. Bye.